welcome to all of you. It's such a pleasure to be here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, and it's a uh, and it's a privilege to moderate a panel with such amazing journalists. We're going to talk a little bit, have a conversation up here, but we're going to reserve uh, time toward the end so that you can pose your questions on the topics that uh, that you want to talk about, either the things that we've discussed uh, during our previous conversation or, or anything else that you're that you're interested in. And just one note as we get started, despite the title of this panel, everyone on this panel deals with, reports on, writes about, talks about the Trump White House, but none of us are the beat reporters who are there every day, for which I suspect we are all grateful. <laughs> Let's start with uh, three tweets from the president uh, in the past 24 hours. One, the Amazon Washington Post, sometimes referred to as a guardian of Amazon not paying internet taxes, which they should, is fake news. By the way, that's a new nickname, Amazon Washington Post. We haven't seen that before. Also, Amazon does not own the Washington Post, and I don't know what internet taxes they aren't paying. But here's the second one. Wow, CNN had to retract big story on Russia with three employees forced to resign. What about all the other phony stories they do, fake news? And finally, this one. The failing New York Times writes false story after false story about me. They don't even call to verify the facts of the story a fake news joke. So Elizabeth Bue Miller, as Washington Bureau Chief of the failing New York Times. <laughs> what's the, what do you make of, of an attack like that? Is it something you've seen before in your experience in Washington? And, and what kind of impact do you think it has? Well, it's part of the new normal in our lives. I mean, this has never happened before where we have a president obviously tweeting. Uh, I, that tweet landed at about, it was 5 a.m. here, I think. It woke me up. 7 a.m. in Washington, which is about the time the president tweets. Sometime between 6.30 and 8, we usually get the tweets. Uh, it, we've never seen this before, and it is part of, of the new normal in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, as it is the new normal anybody in Washington who covers the president. Uh, and we've kind of set up an infrastructure to try and deal with it, which is, uh, we, we, as of next week, we're going to have somebody uh, in the bureau at 6 a.m. dealing with this. Um, we have, I'm up, I'm up before 6, and I'm at home uh, dealing with it. We have, we have six White House reporters who, you know, we, who, are, uh, who look at the tweets. We don't cover every single tweet, but the ones that we deem newsworthy, we cover. We kind of treat them like press releases. The problem is, for us, uh, it's completely unpredictable. It's it, very early in the morning, middle of the day, very late at night. We never know exactly. A lot of times you don't know what he means in the tweets. Uh, and so there's a big struggle to figure out uh, what, what is he saying here. Uh, other times he will, in, in two different tweets around the same time, say opposite things. It's a big struggle. And in this case, that, as you have told me, Glenn Thrush did tweet back and say, no, I did try and verify facts with the White House. I mean, we wouldn't have, Glenn would not have written that story without um, without checking with the White House. I mean, that's what we do. So uh, that's, um, but it's part of a very strange uh, new normal in Washington. Uh, covering this president is like, uh, uh, Susan and I go way back covering presidents. We won't go far, <laughs> way back. I, we, were, we were former White House reporters. Uh, and it's, I've, no one has ever seen anything like this. And it's a, it's a really um, extraordinary challenge. This is my sixth president, and it's just, you know, I was, I was uh, telling Anna before we started that um, the first five presidents I covered were really different, I thought. But compared to Trump, they're all clustered over here, and President Trump is over here. John, you write about political history. You have a fantastic new book out, uh, Whistle Stop. Uh, definitely worth buying on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> only on Amazon. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, is, this, is this, in fact, unprecedented? Or, or is in our history, have there been cases where We've had a president who is so um, openly hostile to the reporters who cover him every day. We've had the open hostility. We have the famous Nixon press conference where, um, uh, where the president said, "You know, don't don't uh, get the the, the uh, don't don't feel like um, that you upset me because I can only be upset by someone I respect." Um, and if you read any of his, if you listen to his tapes or you listen, read uh, through Haldeman's uh, diaries, he was. Um, 
you know, is violently uh, opposed to the press. They had a series of different strategies. There was the Buchananism strategy and the Haldeman strategy, all to basically defeat and dismantle and, and, uh, and downgrade the press. That was of a different order than all presidents who hate the press. Um, I think what's different, of course what's different here, and the reason the tweets are interesting and important is because they are, both A, social media is the fastest way to the id of anyone, um, and so that's true of presidents as well as humans. Um, and also, um, presidents by which as well I mean, as humans. Well, I mean, by which I mean that that you know the presidents are are up here, and the rest of us are not the leader of the free world. Um, and um, what you usually had is you had some filter of some sort. So a, a famous story uh, or, um, is uh, Harry Truman was furious with the railroad union bosses because they shut down the railroads and it was crippling the economy. And so he wrote an address to Congress, longhand on uh, legal paper. And in it, he basically said at the end, um, he argued basically that the railroad bosses were selling out the country and all these boys had died in the Second World War and these railroad bosses just wanted out for themselves and they didn't sacrifice as the, as the boys who'd fought the Germans had. And then he said to the country, you know, we must rally together hang a few traitors and get this country amusing. Yeah. He was talking about hanging the railroad union bosses. And Clark Clifford and, uh, and Truman's um, press secretary took the speech out of the president's hand uh, and never let him give it. And he calmed down. He gave another speech that was pretty hard uh, and harsh, but he didn't say, I want to go hang the union bosses. There's no, there's no that process doesn't exist anymore. So th that's the part that's unprecedented, is the, is the lack of space between thought and, and statement. Um, and the rapidity and the fact that it then can get spread not by the usual distribution channels, but by people retweeting it uh, or it getting into people's social media uh, structure. So that's what's, that's what's so different. Jillian Tett, what do you think? Um, well, I'm in a slightly different position because I'm a sort of insider-outsider in that you can hear from my accent I'm not American. Um, I also was a social anthropologist before I became a journalist, but I'm now overseeing um, a news operation in the U US. And I think if you step back for a minute from the day-to-day -day reporting, you need to recognize that actually what's going on is not just an attack on the media. It's a deliberate attempt to disintermediate the media and also to destabilize the media. And it's actually the fourth time in 100 years we've seen this kind of disintermediation going on. It's not the first time. If you think back to the advent of the radio and the first time you had radio addresses by the president in the 1930s, at that time, the print media was furious at the first radio address because they felt like they were being disintermediated. Um, if you think about the first time you had television addresses by the president, again, there was a strong reaction by the print media because they were being disintermediated. In some ways, what President Obama did with email also disintermediated the traditional channels. And each time, there's been a sense that this just isn't quite right. The media's been angry. Over time, they've had to adjust. And so, yes, a lot of what's going on is a direct attack against the media. A lot of it is shocking. But at the same time, it's also a question of a social pattern or cultural pattern of communication undergoing a major technological shift that we all need to get used to. Molly if I, yeah, if I could cut in on that, I think on the one hand, it's true that there has always been a struggle for control of the various channels of communication. And it's always true that politicians have vied for control of that with the various uh, members of the media, whether they are from whatever medium, whether it's radio. And it is true that the media has been in a process of disruption for about the last 100 years, where you know I started out in newspapers, and when radio came along, it was going to kill us, and then television was going to kill radio, and so on and so forth. I do think there is a difference when you have an administration that is seeking to crush the media overall and seek to broadcast from its own channels its message without any mediation at all. With, and, and so you have the economic story of what's been happening in media over the past 100 years, which is an economic story, which is something that you know certainly I've lived through as someone who came up through print journalism and newspapers. And then I think it's a different story what you have going on with, um, with politicians and with administrations and with what this administration has really brought to a pinnacle, which is really seeking to go around the press in a way that is unprecedented and seeking to communicate with people and to deceive people. 
right? Really seeking to discredit the media, discredit the media as organs of truth, to say that we are not, we don't have any special status as the mediators of truth, and that the administration is seeking to replace us in a lot of ways, to in, in the way that it uh, propagates information to its followers and seeks to make that a, 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 a totally arbitrary thing, right? To say that this is the truth that we put out, you have a truth that you put out, and it's not any better or any worse, and there's no sort of absolute In, in fact, what strikes me as different in this presidency, from, from uh, as a, I understand the point about disruptions in the way news gets delivered, and that's certainly something we're dealing with, but in pre previous presidents I've covered, um, all hated the press, if not at the beginning of their term, by about three weeks in. So <laughs> that's, that's not different. But all of them sometimes grudgingly acknowledge a role for the press in our democracy that could not be replaced by anything else. And so even when they hated the press, there was a respect for the press or a feeling that the <coughs> press was something um, uh, that, that had a role that was in fact important even if we are imperfect. And I don't see that acknowledgement but, from this, from this but administration. I'll, after Anna speaks, I want to say something. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. I would just say the one thing that is stunning, I mean, yes, he does attack us every day. Let's have tough skin about this. But he also uses the press. Glenn, Thrush, and Maggie have had more interviews. I was about to say, <laughs> a lot of this is for the base. I mean, <clears throat> much of it's for the base. Yeah. And, and, you know, he goes after the press. But I have to tell you, this White House, there's a lot of access to this White House. So OK, there's not an on-camera briefing every day anymore. Maybe it's one day a week. But um, they talk to the press. They scream about the leaks. And in this administration, many of them are coming out of the White House. And they talk to, the, they talk to reporters. These anonymous administration officials you read about, those are right out of the Trump White House, very senior officials. So if, I mean, a lot of this is politics. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm just saying let's, let's, there's a certain cynicism that's going on here, and there's a certain reality of Washington that's going on. And can I also say, again, in my role as kind of you know, resident insider outsider, mm -hmm. that um, for us, we certainly have better access to this White House than we've had for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because you know, let's face facts, the previous Obama White House was extremely tightly controlled. It often felt like there was a rather cozy cartel of the New York Times, Washington Post, um, and Wall Street Journal, and that was basically the cartel. Um, and you know, one can look at it from the outside and say, actually, I don't like in any way, shape, or form what's happening now. But what was happening before was not necessarily perfect either. Yeah. John, you had a great okay. interview. I'm yeah. sure you guys thought it was okay. There's a competitive issue going on here, but you know, that's um, something that I think people need to acknowledge. John, you had a uh, very interesting interview with uh, President Trump recently on on Face the Nation that involved interviewing him and several, traveling with him, I think, to West Point. Um, that was Mattis in West Point. It was yeah. Harrisburg. Was Harris, about, okay. Yeah. Traveling with him, you interviewed him in the Oval Office. You seemed to piss him off so much, there was a point where we thought he was apparently going to escort you out of the Oval Office forcibly. Talk about how that great access got negotiated and, and, how, it, and how it worked. Um, Okay, one just quick thing I want to add to the previous conversation is that the, the reason that the lack of mediation between thought from president and speech by the administration, which is to say a tweet, um, is so different than what we've had before is that fireside chats, even Kennedy's press conferences, um, all of the things that changed the, um, you know, Obama going on between two ferns were thought through by White Houses to a fare thee well. Uh, even though they were of a different medium, that almost caused more thinking through. In this case, you have the president often tweeting at his own design, which is often very much at odds with the policies of his own administration. Um, and so when, he's, when he tweets in support of the, of the, um, the sanctions on Qatar, and his Secretary of Defense and State are talking about the necessary and important relationship between the United States and Qatar, that's a problem. When he tweets and undermines his national security director when he's talking about what the president said in the Oval Office, that's very different. So that's where this just basically lack of space between thought and action is very different than, than what we've seen before, especially at such a rate. Anyway, the, the interview we did, I'd interviewed him quite a lot during the campaign. Um, they wanted to do something at 100 days. Uh, everybody pitched 100 days stories. Ours was matched, the interview on, on Face the Nation was matched with uh, um, CBS This Morning, um, actually did their show from inside the White House. Um, 
And the, there was no negotiation over what we would talk about. There, was, there were different settings. There was the Roosevelt Room, which was going to be about the health care bill and about the kind of uh, news of the minute. Uh, the Oval Office was going to be more about the job, the weight of the job, the, um, the, his place in history as he saw it. Um, you know, every president designs the Oval Office sort of to suit their purposes and their needs, and it is a physical space that matches the kind of view of themselves that presidents have. And so the conversation was just to carry on that uh, kind of uh, flavor. And then the, on the road in Harrisburg was going to be um, more of the kind of policy stuff on immigration, um, the economy, and so forth. So, so tell about the, the incident where it looked like he was going to like punch you in the face. Yeah. Uh, so we were having a conversation about the, the enormity of the office, and I asked about uh, the missiles that he had um, launched into Syria, the 59 Tomahawk missiles, and I asked him about, you know, there, that kind of decision is obviously among the weightiest that a president makes. There aren't a lot of human beings who have had the, a job where they have to do that in the United States who you can call and say, you know, work through some of either those issues or the other ones that you have to make these decisions on a life and death life and death decisions on an hourly basis sometimes. And there's only a few people alive you could talk to. And the president had talked at length when he first met with President Obama after he'd been elected and said, I want to reach out to you and seek your counsel. And there was a lot of that talk. So I said, do you do that? And he said, no, because he'd been nice with words, but his actions were, um, were not nice. And so I asked him what he meant. And he said, well, you can figure it out. And I said, well, I mean, this was, he was like, I guess, because I, I wasn't sure. And so I asked him about, what, were you talking about the wire, your claim that he wiretapped Trump Tower? And he, I, I don't really remember. There was a lot of back and forth. Uh, and basically, I just kept trying to figure out what he was talking about. Um, and he did, and at some point, he just said, that's enough, and walked away and went behind his desk, uh, which left me in the weird position of not knowing what to do with myself. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and I <laughs> know. So I, I sort of showed myself out, and um, it was and a wonderful. Was, it was a wonderful moment. Uh, uh, I was glad that you actually showed it on, on the air. Um, you know, Anna Palmer, you're the co-author of, of the, the playbook in Politico, which is, I'm sure, one of the first things all of us read every morning, and I'm sure one of the first things everybody in the White House reads every morning. And sometimes it's a, a place the White House floats ideas, but sometimes it's a place that anti-Trump people float ideas. So talk about how that works in terms of your access and who you talk to and what you hear, have, the feedback you get. Yeah, I think one of the best tools for in the case we make to the administration and to members of Congress and to operatives is that this is a place for shadow boxing, right? Kind of the influential people in Washington, in the administration, in Congress, and kind of around the country are reading it every morning to kind of set the agenda. And we've had uh, a lot of success. I came from covering Congress from a really long time, but in terms of making headway with the administration that when they have a message they want to send or a signal they want to send, they can do it through us. Politico by far has not had a great relationship with the Trump particularly the campaign. We were one of the first people banned and didn't really talk about it, um, you know, where we kind of buy tickets to try to get into rallies and things like that. Um, but I think we, uh, Jake uh, Sherman and I, who write that, have tried very hard to kind of forge a working relationship, as it were. But you know, he, they also get really upset at us, because we try to call balls and strikes as we see them. So when they get upset with you, how do you hear from them? Uh, it can be everything from a phone call to an email to you know, someone screaming at you. So um, that, I would say that's not just Trump. I mean, that, that would happen in Speaker yes, Paul right. Ryan's office or anybody else's. So all, all it is not, uh, a, it, when someone's upset at you, it's not an uncommon reaction. It's not just a, a Trumpian thing. Part of the job. Yes, when, uh, exactly. when, during the Clinton White House, um, uh, Joe Lockhart would call me like often to complain about stories. And first, I thought he was complaining because sometimes they weren't stories. They were stories, sometimes stories I'd written, but often stories someone else had written. Sometimes they were stories I had not read, uh, you know, in USA Today. And uh, he would call and read me out, and I would say, "Well, is there something inaccurate? Is there some, is there some action you want me to take?" And it became clear to me that he just wanted to yell at me, hang up, and I, then obviously go back and tell the president, "I oh, really, I told her." <laughs> and so at, at that point, I took it somewhat less seriously, and it didn't upset me as much as the first couple calls uh, had come. Do, do any of you hear from the president himself when he's unhappy with something in your publication? If you're willing to share that, which you may not be. Well, there are different ways. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not directly, not directly. No, you hear indirectly. Though. Yeah. Indirectly, yeah. like a note through your door. Uh. <laughs> it's the people that you hear from yeah. that you. It, it it depends on who you are hearing from that you will know whether or not it is direct. I think, right? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. No, well, I was just thinking through all the different levels. <laughs> uh, so we can call you dishonest to your face. Yeah. You can get a, an email that is somebody speaking on his behalf. Exactly. There was definitely during the campaign, there was a lot of Mr. Trump feels yep. this way. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then you can get it verbally, um, which but is different than just getting yelled at. It's getting yelled at. Oh, and you, it's clear that it's at somebody else's, at his direction. Um, I found that the president reads in print. So something can be online for almost 24 hours, and you'll only get a call the next morning. It's the power of newspapers. <laughs> yeah, because he's yeah. reading in, on, in print. Yeah. Thank you can God always, for old people. <laughs> you can always tell. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I thought during the campaign, uh, one thing I admired uh, very much about candidate Trump was his, access, his accessibility. Um, he did news conferences. He did news conferences when he was in trouble, when he knew the questions were going to be hostile. He did a ton of interviews. He did TV interviews. I mean, he was more accessible than any um, uh, front-running kind of candidate I've ever seen. And um, that has, uh, that happened, that continued into his presidency, but it's, I feel like it's kind of changed now. Do you I feel think so? he actually got too much credit for that. Mm -hmm. he, that happened during the primary campaign, mm -hmm. and it was over by the time he became a general election candidate. In fact, by the time the general election was taking place, Hillary Clinton did more interviews than Donald Trump did. I find and that so, so hard to believe because she was so hard to get an interview mm -hmm. with. It's true, yeah. and I still have a standing request yeah, for an me interview too. with her that yeah. still has not been granted. So I still think that she could have been much more accessible. At the same time, his accessibility was almost entirely during the early primary mm -hmm. campaign. His last press conference was the pre-convention press conference where he begged Russia to hack her emails. Mm -hmm. That was the last press conference he held during the election, and that was in July. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so we all got this impression mm -hmm. that he was so accessible because he'd all called all of us up, yeah. and he'd all done interviews with all of us. But, it, but as a general ex election candidate, he was not accessible at all. He did very few interviews, and he used that sort of goodwill that he'd accumulated it's a, under basically false pretenses, right? He, 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 he did not do those interviews during the general election, basically from July to November. But he, was, he was totally under wraps. And, and, and Hillary was having reporters come on her plane. I was on the Trump plane. It was not the plane that Donald Trump was on. There was no access to no, him. That was terrible. I yeah. got off that plane very quickly yeah. because it, wasn't, it was useless. But so, and she had the, the reporters on her plane. She was talking to the reporters. She was, you know, there with them partying the night that the Cubs won the World Series, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, he was much more accessible in the early going. And I absolutely commend him for that. And I spoke with him in that period. And it was, I think, very important for him to be accessible to reporters. I think more candidates ought to be that accessible to reporters. But it is also true that, that that cut off at a certain point and did not pick back up. And I would just say, I, I think Trump thinks he's his best messenger. So when he has a point he wants to get across, he calls up reporters and has direct conversations in a way on the record that I don't recall President mm -hmm. Barack Obama doing. Uh, and I think that, you know, with 100 Days was a great time, right? I mean, he did more interviews back to back to back and making lots of news. But I do think he. He's accessible when he thinks it, it matters for him. Well, that, because that's true for all of us, right? <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and we all will believe or when us, someone believe hasn't stopped him. None yeah. of us would say, oh, no, we aren't going to take that call because we haven't heard from you in a, in a few weeks. Right. The whole power of Trump, if you like, or his whole style was all about sort of counterpoint to this excessively controlled, yeah. premeditated, clinical, and frankly, very robotic style of Hillary Clinton. And again, you know, my experience of dealing with the Obama White House, of dealing with the Clinton campaign, was the level of control and clinical precision was, in many ways, quite deadening, quite off-putting. And there was something about the spontaneous, uncontrolled, you know, sometimes completely crazy aspect of Trump, which was defined in opposition to the Clinton um, campaign. Mm -hmm. can, can I make it was a very exciting. Can, can I make a fuddy-duddy point, which is? Um, Access, uh, in a campaign in particular and in general, it's important to have access to a president to see how they think, how they view the world, to get them on the record, to set benchmarks against which they can be measured later. But there's also something that is a crucial part of the transaction we do, which is the explaining function. Why is the White House doing what they're doing in the name of the people who elected them and who pay their salaries? 
Um, and it's absolutely the case that the previous White Houses uh, that I've covered were all tight and the, and the Obama one was tighter, but they, it feels like they've gotten tighter. I mean, Clinton was, was um, less tight than Bush and on down the line. Um, but you could get explanations for policy and why policy was being um, put forward. And you could get people on the phone to explain to you why the policy was important and how it was being rolled out. And you could get an explanation for why they were doing what they were doing. Um, the level of accessibility to the president uh, does not have a match in that category. Um, and that's a huge problem. And that is, a, so accessibility is important in two different ways. You want to have a president who's accessible, but you also want to have a White House that thinks it's important to participate in the explanatory function of governing, as opposed to just the cut and thrust of pol politics. Um, and they don't have a great um, passion for fulfilling <laughs> the, the explanatory function of the job. And that's the most important thing, because people care uh, they watch and care a lot about the, the freneticism in the theater of the Trump campaign, um, but on issues from immigration to, um, to infrastructure, to health care, to taxes, there's a lot of complicated intellectual stuff that's going on or not going on that doesn't get explained. Well, I think that's, that's worse than that, that is, is that you often get, uh, on the same day, totally different mm -hmm. um, positions on the same right. issue from very senior people in the White House, and you have no idea which way it's going, and the example is NAFTA, as you probably remember. In the morning, uh, they were going to pull out of the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, and in the afternoon, they weren't. And we wrote both stories and got a call from New York from my big boss saying, uh, what's happening down there? What have you gotten wrong? And I said, well, we were right in the morning, and we it were right, right in the afternoon. right when we wrote it. <laughs> yeah, it was right at this hour. It was right at that hour. But it's this, it, the, the factionalism in the White House, that there's always fact, there are always factions in White Houses, always. And they often disagree. But this is, again, of a different nature, a where you have a new level of very senior people telling us the exact opposite thing. And you are just stuck with, what are we going to write? And um, so we wrote two different things. Well, I think, I, think, I think it's an additional problem to that, that even when you do have a source of information telling you that it's this way or it's that way, you can't trust it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you may too. write two separate stories both of which are extremely well sourced and neither of which may be true because there are so many people lying to you. And so for me, one of the difficulties has been you want to have sources. You want to get a comprehensive view of what's going on. You want to have a lot of people inside the administration telling you how it is. But they might all be telling you lies. Or and they're, so, they're telling you what, what or they Or telling you self-serving versions. Or their of perception of where the president and is. And it's always the, and it's always the case that you have to backstop your sources. You it's know, always is, the um, case that you have to figure out you know, what people's motivations are for telling you different things. But to my knowledge, it has not been to this level before where people are fabricating things out of whole cloth and, and, and promoting versions of the truth that may not have any basis of in reality. Well, and, this and, is, that, um, and that makes I it a whole difficult One, one reason that a daily briefing has been an important fixture in White Houses for in modern times. Um, you know, a daily briefing where an, an official who is designated to speak for the president takes questions and gives answers as, as possible. And a big debate now about the state of the day, daily briefing, whether a daily briefing is going to be held. It's not no longer held every day. Also, whether it's going to be on camera or not. And that's been, uh, and also whether you can trust it. You know, whether the things that are said from the podium are things you can write down and believe, OK, other people tell me other things, but this does represent what the president says. How, how, what do you make of this debate over the daily briefing? Is it important? Is it worth the battles that we're um, having uh, with the White House to try to insist on it? Sure. I mean, I think we, anybody who covers the White House knows, as you and I know, that the, the daily briefing is not where you get most of your information. No. Anybody who relies on that is the basis of their reporting is, you know, no one does that who's a good reporter. However, um, it, is, it is a chance for the public to see on camera uh, where they are on the issues and how are they responding to the issues today and, and tough questions. Um, it's just a good, uh, it's transparency. 
they, they only started televising them in the Clinton administration. That's right. So it doesn't go back. Um, and you know, there is a lot of grandstanding at that briefing. Uh, back in the day, it just actually, there used to be a gaggle in the mornings at 9.30 that was off camera, it was efficient. You would go in, it used to be in the press secretary's office and they moved it out after 9.11 to the, the larger room because it got, there were so many reporters. But that lasted about 15 minutes, no cameras, it was efficient, you found out where the White House was on the issues of the day. You kind of got a read for the early part of the day. Um, and that was way, always, I thought, way better than the noon briefing, because it would drag on for an hour. You know, it was the middle of the day. You had to be sort of knowing what you were doing by then. Um, but I do think it's important to have it, because if the public sees it. And it's, it's just, it, 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 it holds them to account. I think it's a really important part of democracy. Is it important that it be, uh, Anna, do you think it's important that it be televised? Because there is, grandstanding is a nice way of putting what sometimes happens with reporters when the bright lights come and shine on them. Uh, and I noticed today that, um, that Mike McCurry, who first opened the briefings right. to regular mm -hmm. televised coverage, and Ari Flesher, who was so, the press secretary in the Bush administration, they issued a joint tweet. Now, it was the first time I'd ever seen a joint tweet <laughs> issued, but OK, that's where we live, um, saying the briefing should be daily. They should be on the record. They should be recorded, but they should be embargoed so they aren't televised live. So you can't air the tape until the briefing is over. Is it important, they be, and, and reporters are very much, reporters are there really pushing back against the idea that they're not gonna be able to carry it live and on camera. Does that matter, do you think, Anna? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think, to what Elizabeth said, I, I think it's transparency, I think it's putting the, the spokesman on the record, on camera, it's not just a recording that you're putting it in the press. You know, I'm, I obviously don't work for a media company that has a camera there every day, but I have a lot of friends who do, and I think that, you know, this is kind of the basic tenets of why they, you know, originally were gonna try to move the press, you know, where the press were out of the White House, right? There's these, some of these things that are really important, proximity, getting them on the record, those types of things. You're our representative from the broadcast side. Is it important that it be, uh They'd be on camera, and if it's on camera, that it be available for live transmission. Which do I have to wait my job now, or the 25 years I spent in print? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, you went to the other side. Because if I'd end so. in print, I would have. Uh, well, I think that if you, um, I think it's important that it be televised. Does it have to be televised every day? I don't. I'm not sure that it necessarily has to be. I think the the peacocking, as George W. Bush used to call it, of the people, um, you know, trying to ask an 18 part question to get themselves noticed or to get into these pointless um, dead end fights. That's no good for that's no good for anybody. I do think, though, that in the current medium that most people participate in, which is a televised medium, even if it's sent through social media. Um, I think it's important that they be on the record. And also, by the way, it shouldn't be that hard for a lot of things. Because if you're being straightforward and honest, then it's OK. Now, to be fair, um, a lot of what they're rebelling against is one of, the, one of our faults, um, which is chopping up and only you know, providing a portion of what people will watch, or in social media, people doing that on their own. And then the clip that gets around the world um, is context-free, and it makes them look terrible. And so um, I don't think it's an easy question. Um, if there was a bias towards information sharing and explanation at the White House, I think it would probably be easier to make an accommodation. I think since everything is a fight at the ramparts for just simple explanation that's clear and direct and sticks, I think that's why you have this being, it's a symbolic as well as a real fight. Um, but I should say as a final thing, you know, the president's argument for why he talked about tapes was that he thought it would keep James Comey, the former FBI director, honest. So by the president's logic, if you have tapes of something, then it keeps people honest. So it turns out we agree with him on that. <laughs> if you have recordings of things, it keeps an administration honest. <laughs> that's, a great, well, that's a great line. Well, as, as Comey said, lordy, I hope there are tapes. <laughs> But no, I, I think exactly as John is saying. I mean, we have to think back to the original ra rationale for having a briefing, which is back in the day, there was just one dude covering the White House for your organization. And it was their job to go get answers from the White House for whatever story everyone was working on. And everybody was working on a different story. There are 20 different stories in the paper, all of which needed some information from the White House. Hey, what's your stance on this? Hey, where did you come down on this? And it was real information. It wasn't talking points. It wasn't BS. It was actual substance. It, it, it was, here's what we think about this. 
And so you would have a single person whose job it was to go to the White House and get all of the answers to all of the questions at once. And if you could put that on camera, everybody could get all of the answers at once. All of the different news organizations who are all trying to get all of those answers in one place could all do it at once. And, like, and, and that's a very noble goal. And I think everything should be available to all of the public all of the time, because why on earth would be, we be hiding this from people? Why can't everybody be able to get some buy-in? And, and sure, if there's a little bit of grandstanding, I think that our democracy can withstand that. And it's a good thing if we can bring more people into the process and have everybody be an observer. And when uh, what, I, what bothers me is why would you try to squelch that? Why would you not have that? Why would you try to turn the clock back on that? And Maybe, yeah, sure, maybe it's inconvenient, or maybe it's gross, or maybe it's tough to have everybody be looking at you. But I do not see a good reason why it all cannot take place in the plain light of day. Whether, and, and you know, there are reporters who don't like it, too. There are reporters who wish that everybody wasn't looking at them. But to have that interchange take place where it's just a question and answer session, that's the whole point of it. And, and so I wonder when there are erosions of that, what, what purpose is being served by that? Jillian. I mean, transparency is fantastic, and we can all agree on that. Um, the challenge for the media today, though, is how do you have transparency of these White House briefings without turning television into a 24-hour non-stop reality TV show, or the kind of Sean Spice of reality TV show, where you have this endless, breathless coverage Has without very much, already? and that, well, exactly, but that, there's so much breathless t reality TV show coverage, there isn't enough analysis, there isn't enough explanation, there isn't enough context setting, and that's the real challenge right now. And to come back to the point earlier about the, the prob problem of getting any explanation out of the current White House and getting these co completely contradictory stories, I mean, I think in some ways, to be really cynical, the only way to make sense of what's going on right now is to regard the White House not as a modern, governmental bureaucracy, but basically a medieval <laughs> court, rather like you know Louis Saint, um, Sun King in France or something like that, where if you start thinking about power structures in that context, and this is you know, again 101 anthropology, you've basically got you know, an emperor who's somewhat capricious, um, who changed his mind day to day, surrounded by a bunch of courtiers who are constantly <laughs> vying for attention and control and power. The normal bureaucratic machinery, the normal power structures and the hierarchy simply don't work anymore. I mean, I know that from talking to people and trying to get stories you know, confirmed or not confirmed. And so why anyone would think with a European medieval court that you would actually have clear cut explanation and briefings that make sense I don't know, but it's basically, you know, Louis Sun, um, Sun King, you know, masquerading as a 21st century normal yeah, government. Well, this, this is, is not exactly, exactly our constitution. And I'm sorry, right, I exactly. can only say that because I'm not American. But that's so my the, view. the challenge, and this is one of the big challenges with the Trump administration, is whether we cover it against a certain standard. What's the standard against which we cover it? Do we cover it by the standard they would like it to be? Because they'd love it if it were a medieval court. Because chaos, and this is the way the president has, was as successful as a candidate, was as successful as a businessman, is to create distraction and chaos and use that to, um, all White Houses try to do this. They just do it in a different way and with more theatricality. And so do you play by their rules or do you say, we are maintaining a certain set of standards here uh, and, then, and then say that you are falling short of those standards because it turns out the standards, as you say, ultimately come from a system of government that's had some durability over yeah. time. Let's, um, President, we're going to go to questions in just a moment. I'm going to ask one, one final question. President Trump says that the news media is not fair to him. Uh, Anna, do you think we're fair to him? I think we try to be fair. I mean, I think I get up every morning and I don't have a, you know, any ax to grind with him or his administration. I think you're just trying to find out the facts and relay them as such, and what, for me, what the state of play is. John Dickerson, do you think that we're fair to Trump? I think we're fair. I think that um, there is a problem with White Houses in the aggregate. In the, I mean, it's both the reality show nature of his White House, the reality show nature of the coverage and the, and the benefit that a lot of different news organizations get from covering the shiny objects and from covering the conflict and from covering the 
Michigas of the Trump administration. Um, and that is not a fairness or unfairness question. It's a proportionality question, um, which is um, something that I think is out of whack. I think there is, co there, are, there is coverage of parts of the administration that is overboard because in the, in the aggregate, I mean, when you walk through an airport and you just see the screens on the televisions, um, you know, it, not every moment is a breaking news moment, but it is presented in that fashion. And so that's not a, that's not treating him fair, you know, have we given him a fair shake on his positions about health care? Um, that's a, I don't know, it's a proportionality. I problem. feel like I just want to say, well, I think it's a bias, or at least as journalists, for tension mm -hmm. and drama mm -hmm. and the dramatization of what's happening. Right. And so I think if there's any bias, that's what it is to, and I think that's often their frustration when right. they say, oh, this wasn't that big of a deal or whatever, but we're trying to find the backstory and how it happened. Molly Ball. But if there is a Michigas bias, <laughs> it is pro Trump. There is no. You mean it benefits it. Yeah, absolutely. There is no better. Uh, there, there's no more drama politician than Trump. I mean, if anything, he has benefited from our bias toward conflict, yeah, toward uh, drama, toward the immediate, toward, the long term, toward yeah. freak out, right? Toward outrageousness. And throughout his campaign, he benefited from the fact that he was able to say things more outrageously than any other candidate would have dared to say, and he got a lot of publicity out of that. At the same time, I, I do think, you know, my, my colleague, my esteemed colleague, David Frum, uh, was tweeting a while ago about, um, I don't know who it was, but he was tweeting about a Hollywood actress who was asked at some point whether she thought that the media coverage of her was fair, and she said, well, they say I drink too much, and it's true. They say that I sleep with too many men, and it's true. They say that I'm difficult to work with, and that's true, too. So yes, I think it's been fair. You know, it, it, is, it is not the case that our job is to make an equal balance of positives and negatives right. if that is not what is true. Our job is to tell the truth. And I actually think that we, as the media, have done an excellent job of telling the truth about this administration. And people can like Trump or not like Trump, and that is not our business, but we have portrayed the entirety of what is going on, which is in a very extraordinary and a great story to cover. Let me be true, but let me be clear about that. I have had more fun covering the Trump campaign and administration than almost anything else. But the but when we portray the entirety of it, I think we are giving people an accurate picture of something that they can judge as positive or negative. But uh, but that doesn't mean that you know, the, 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 the balance doesn't mean that, that it is neutral. But Elizabeth B. Miller, you know, one thing that has occurred to me is we have become much more, we as an institution have become much more aggressive yes. about calling out untruths. Yes. And in, including in headlines and in leads to say the president said this, which is not true, or he said this and there's no evidence for it. And I think that makes us seem um, quite adversarial. And I think to people who are supportive of President Trump, that feeds the sense that we are not fair we're to not him. fair. But I think, uh, to answer your question, I think we're fair, but I think we're tough. I think we're very tough. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that's our job, is to hold people in power to account. And I think that it's a good thing that we now, it's happened with other presidencies, but the extent of the, um, the inaccuracies and untruths are so, are so <laughs> extensive in this administration that we've started doing things we probably should have been doing a long yeah. time ago. It was like it, the Trump administration has been, to me, a reminder of why, of why we do I wanted this. to be a journalist yes. and what our role ought to be. Yeah. Well, let's, I, we've talked a long time. We've, I know we're going to have some great questions here. There are people with microphones, and uh, we'd like the questions to be. So there's a microphone over here. Um, and if you uh, want to, we have one, we have one here? Have OK, ready, ready to go. Stand Hello. And state your Center aisle. There you go. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Arne Menconi, and I have a question for John. John, uh, as an example, uh, when the Moab bomb was dropped in Afghanistan, what we found from Vox and the la what I've learned from Fox, you know, you only had to write, read like four papers when I was growing up. Now you have to take in like a hundred different sources. Sure. But <clears throat> it wasn't a decision by Trump according to Vox. It wasn't a decision by Mathis. It wasn't a decision by Danford. It wasn't a decision by Vogel with CENCOM. It was a decision made by the general 
of, a, of Afghanistan. And you un, it takes so long to unpack this. And then what that says to a consumer of news is, who's making the decision? Anyone running a corporation understands that if somebody made that big of a decision, and then in the noise of the news, with all of the threats to uh, Saudi Arabia and now to um, what, what came out today with North Korea, how do we uh, differentiate what's going on here and where the decision on something that serious yeah, is being made? It's a great question. Um, one of the first questions I asked um, the vice president when he was, after the, the elector was, who's going to drive the bus here in the administration? Because you, and on Russia, you see it where you have different, the president says something different than the secretary of state, than the, than the UN ambassador. I think the Moab situation was a little tricky because it was in the switchover in the, in the administration where basically the president said to Mattis, you have uh, the freedom to do what you need to implement your, your strategy, um, which is a kind of freedom that they've been asking for that he campaigned on, the idea that the president would stop micromanaging things. Um, and the use of the Moab was kind of right in that moment. Um, and Mattis was not thrilled with it, um, but it was not out of bounds in terms of the commander's um, uh, uh, discretion to use it. Um, but I think what you have now is a situation in which um, the Secretary of Defense has more control and uh, more decisions on his shoulder than, um, than we've had with previous Secretaries of Defense. Uh, and so ultimately it should still, uh, that, this almost doesn't really matter though, because at the end of the day it's the President's uh, responsibility. So if Mattis makes the call, it would be, um, unheard of and wrong, essentially, for the president to try and say, well, that's what he did. So, and there was a little bit of this, it was a, kind of a semantic deal, but when there were, the Yemen raid went wrong, the president said they lost, and I can't remember the name of the, of the special forces operator, but um, as if the decision was made by somebody else. Um, so I think um, there has been quite a lot of coverage about the leeway that Secretary Mattis has been given, so I think it's now a part of the understanding in the context of any military operation that takes place. Um, and it is ultimately all still the Commander in Chief's responsibility, even if he's decided to delegate it. But so, it is still, it is, I, I just add to that, it, it is still an unusual situation where, as we've all seen, the national security apparatus is very much in chaos because it is not true who's in charge because there are these competing centers of power and because the president has chosen people who are ostensibly there to be on their own authority and yet have not been given their own authority. I mean, even someone, if you look at the Secretary of Defense, he has not been able to staff up his agency with people who he believes in and there are still a lot of vacancies in a lot of these very crucial national security positions. And you know, my, my brother was an army ranger who did several tours of duty in Afghanistan, and you look at it now, and it is very much not clear who is in charge, and, I, and it does seem like these are the kinds of decisions where the daily noise out of the White House can very much obscure the very substantive issues that are at, at issue, because it's easy to focus on the sort of daily palace intrigue, and who's up and who's down, and who's in charge, when these decisions are, or in most cases are not, being made. And there are quite a lot of decisions in this, in this presidency that have just been left to fester and have not actually been decided one way or another. Molly, uh, thank you to your uh, brother for his, for his service. Uh, let's get another question. Is there somebody, here's right over here. Hi, um, I'm Fred Turpin, and there's been a lot of discussion at this panel and the earlier one about truth and how the media is an arbiter of truth. And I, I, am, I think it's a fair question to ask, what over the last six months has the media done to distinguish itself as an arbiter of truth? I mean, Harvard University came out with a study that 93% of the coverage of this administration is negative. <clears throat> the, most of the major media you know, told us for six months that Hillary Clinton was going to win in a walk. Um, you know, they, they laughed at Trump when he said he was surveilled by the Obama administration. Now it turns out that Rubio was surveilled and Paul was surveilled and three people were subpoenaed by the Intelligence Committee to answer for surveillance. We were told for three months with breathless excitement 
that Trump was under investigation by the FBI for collusion with Russia, which turned out to not be the case under Comey's testimony, and the only thing probably not leaked by the FBI to the media. And, you know, Anthony Scaramucci got slammed, I don't know, 10 days ago, and people resigned over it. So, and, and these are not trivial issues, right? I mean, treason in the White House is pretty important. Um, you know, and, and so when, 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 when you really reflect on why people are skeptical about whether we have objective news or whether we have advocacy and propaganda or, or whether there's actually anything such as truth in journalism anymore, I, I think there's some real, I mean, half of the country clearly seems to be of an opinion that there's some real questions to be asked here, and I'm, and I'm not hearing them being asked. All right, well, so thanks for your question. <laughs> so let me ask you, what, what, should we, what should we be covering that we're not, that you, you would like us to cover that you don't see that we're doing? Well, it, I, 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 my question was really about truth, right? And I mean, your, your paper has, since January, consistently run the narrative, along with CNN, about Russia collusion. Unnamed sources, multiple agencies, over and over and over. You know, we have the evidence. He's under investigation by the FBI. Wait, 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 it's a matter sorry, of time. Sorry, sorry. Let me just correct you. We have <clears throat> never said there's evidence of collusion. We have yeah. repeatedly and reported under investigation we repeated, by the FBI. No, no, we have not reported that. No, nobody's no, ever said that. No one has not reported that. It, not the president. We have done stories about it, but we have we have always said that at this point there is no evidence of collusion. We are very careful about that, and we never said the president. We never said the president was under investigation either. I can't hear you, sir. Okay, okay. Anybody want to answer that? Would anyone else like to respond? Can we do, yes. I mean, can, we, can we do a vote of the audience? I'd really like to ask the audience how many people in the room, because I think as journalists, you know, we have to be very humble and listen to people. Mm -hmm. I feel that extremely strongly. Um, how many people in the room think that the media has been unfair to Trump over the last, um, over the last year? Unfair. And how many of you think the media have actually been fair and done a good job? Well, and what, what was actually the parallel I'm question? Curious. I'd like to hear your opinions. And, and so some people thought we hadn't been fair to Trump. How many people think we have been too easy on Trump? That's interesting. Yeah. So I, Sorry, I didn't mean to jump some in people thought we've, we've been too hard and fair to Trump. Um, the New York Times had a very interesting article on Sunday talking about each month how many lies Trump had told. It was in black and white. So why do you all, as the best journalists in the country, why do you let him get away with this? Well, but I work for the New York Times. I know you do. So, <laughs> so, how, so you're saying that you've learned that from the New York Times, but somehow we've let him get away with the, with the lies? But I work for the New York Times. So we have, um, that piece was an opinion piece, by the way. That, that was not a, I know it's hard to distinguish, but that was by David Leonhardt, an opinion columnist. It's not in the news columns. We've only, we've only used the word lie about Trump twice. Does that mean it wasn't completely true what he wrote? It means that's David's opinion. I mean, it's that we are very careful about using the word lie because when you say the president lies, that's a judgment call. That's, that, that is, impl you're implying intent. That, you, that means you know what's in his head. I mean, so, but that's a whole other issue. But my point is, you, um, you just said the New York, you read it in the New York Times. Well, obviously, we're covering it. So you, I actually see how you say we're getting away with it. You're, we're letting him get away with it when we're covering it. It's not a conversation. We need to go on. All right. Okay. So that's my we, only comment. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes. Right here, we have Hi, my name is Deborah. Um, I teach in inner city Oakland, um, especially with literacy. And my background knowledge a little bit with Trump is about his literacy, I have questions about that, especially because you, some of you have like interviewed him specifically. So on, especially I think with reading, I'm just like on interviews specifically, he's been saying over the years, All Quiet on the Rest Western Front is the book he's been reading for years. Um, and just not using teleprompters and just wondering how that affects the administration by being so, in my opinion, maybe you have a different opinion because you work more closely, but. Yeah. His I, you know, literacy levels and how that affects the administration. 
when, when you to interview President Trump, he is, um, I think he's pretty charming. He's a smart guy. I, he's, uh, I'm not sure he's a big reader. I think he's probably not a big reader. That doesn't, but that doesn't mean he's uh, not literate. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean he can't read. Um, and he's, he is, uh, he's very engaging in the way a salesman's engaging. And this is, I think, certainly been a big strength of his during the campaign. It's a strength of him. It could be a strength of him in lobbying Congress if he chooses to do that. It worked with the House, some on the health care bill. Um, but, you know, there's this, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, and this is in some ways President Trump's own fault, that I'm not sure the sense of some of the strengths of his personality comes through in the way he presents himself to the country. Maybe others who have interviewed him would also have. He was very views. different. He was, uh, he came to the New York Times of not too long after the election. He was, his, it was one of his first big, I think the journal was the first interview. We were, but he came to the Times and came into the building in New York and uh, we did a big interview with him and he, um, was very, uh, he praised the New York Times. <laughs> that was then. And, um, uh, and uh, he was, you know, uh, he, it was a long interview and uh, he was on the record for almost the entire, it was on, yeah. and he was, uh, he did a, you know. I, Julian, I think we as journalists need to recognize that one of the reasons why Trump was elected is that there's a large part of this country um, who feel absolutely furious with the smug, condescension with which much of the liberal educated elite speak. And I say that again, this goes back to my anthropology again, because I spent a lot of time going to... And I do feel this very strongly. And I say that as someone who's got a PhD, okay? So I am part of the problem. I am part of the smug liberal elite. But the issue today, to go back to Pierre Bourdieu or whatever, is not about who has money in this country. It's about who has control of words. And we need to recognize there's a big gap between the educated elite who have control of words, who tend to disdain everyone who does not communicate or talk like they do. And the reality is that Trump talks like and communicates like the way that many people in this country communicate and talk. And that's exactly why he connected so deeply. So frankly, you know, we as educated elite, and that's most of us in the room, need to stop for a minute and think not just about the economic inequality in this country, but also the cognitive, social, if you like, literacy inequality, but also this sense that part of the American dream is built on this idea of meritocracy. Too many people take it for granted that if they are educated and elite and intellectual, then under that meritocracy rubric, they are automatically better than everyone else. And that's exactly what this, this election has shown that most people in this country do not believe in. You know, I've just gotten a... a, 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 a a sign that says that we have zero minutes remaining. But I'd just like to take uh, 30 seconds to say, uh, you know, I really appreciate the passion shown on all sides uh, in this audience. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we have people of different points of view when it comes to these issues. And um, I recognize that, we all recognize that the press is imperfect. Um, there are things we need to do better. Um, I can tell you that all of us strive to do um, what we are supposed to do in our democracy. Uh, and we'll, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep doing that no matter what. And thank you all for joining us. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That, so, and just to introduce the panelists, I'm sorry if I should have done this in a more organized way before, but um, Anna Palmer of Political, John Dickerson of CBS, Molly Ball of The Atlantic, Elizabeth Bumiller of The New York Times, and Jillian Tett of The Financial Times. Yeah.